Praise God. How many of you ready for the word this morning? How many of you hungry for the word? I was sharing on Thursday night. We need to be hungry for God's word. There needs to be an aroma that comes out of the church and comes out of the word of God that makes us hungry. Is anybody with me? I happen to live right close to church's chicken over on Hanley and Waters. And it's inevitable just about every time I come to the red light, there'll be a bus that'll be stopped there. Loading people and unloading, and the light will turn green two or three times. Sometimes it's a little frustrating. You want to dart out around the bus and get in front of it. Then if you do that, it's just liable to pull out by the time you get out in that outside lane and you're stuck out there. But during that time, there's the aroma from church's chicken. Anybody ever smelt chicken when it's being cooked or French fries when it's being you want to just pull in, and I mean, you might not even be hungry, but you want to pull in. And that's the way the Word of God ought to be. It ought to, there ought to be something that comes off the Word of God that makes us hungry for it, makes us desire the Word of God. Are you with me? For a few moments this morning, I'd like to minister on the theme, Fathers That Make the Difference. I said, Fathers That Make the Difference. How many of you will agree with me that a father isn't necessarily just some man that can make babies? Some of you didn't hear me this morning. I said a father is not just somebody that can produce children. But a father is somebody that takes the responsibilities of those children. A father is somebody that takes the responsibilities of that family. A father is somebody that makes the commitment and the statement and lives to the criteria, as Joshua said, as for me and my house. He didn't say just for me. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I'm convinced that being a father has to be someone that decides to serve the Lord. And we're going to look at a few scriptures today, but the psalmist said, Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. So unless the Lord is part of the house, unless the Lord is part of the family, unless Jesus has been made Lord of your life, we will not ever produce what we need to produce and what God desires out of us as fathers. Can I hear an amen? I'm convinced we don't need more preachers today. There's preachers everywhere. We live in a society of preachers. I just rolled through the different television stations, about 150 of them plus this morning, trying to find one that would be ministering on fathers this morning, and not one. Not one, John. They're ministering on the end times, and they're ministering on faith and are ministering on other things, but I thought, you know, at Father's Day, this might be an excellent time for ministers to bring home the importance of real fathers, Christian fathers, but I found none, so I would like to, for a few moments, look at some fathers that make the difference. I'd like to take some fathers that made the difference in the Bible and take a look at them for a few moments and then apply some of these principles to us. Is that all right? First one I would like us to look at is Enoch or Enoch that we all know as the one that walked with God. How many of you know that? Enoch was the one that walked with God and was no more. Amen? He was a man that must have had a relationship with God second to none. But he also was a father. And what a father he was, I'm sure. I often bring up the movie The Last Crusade and in Indiana Jones. At the end of the movie, Indy goes in to find the grail. And there's some things that he has to face first. He has to face the penitent man. 
must pass. He faces understanding the name of God and the word of God. But it's interesting, in the beginning of that movie, Indy's just a boy. He's chasing after a piece of artifacts that he feels belongs in a museum. Another man finds it, but Indy is able to get it from him. He runs to the house, hoping his dad would stand with him. He blasts into the door, and his dad is a very spiritual person studying the deep things of the Hebrew language. And Indy runs in, and all of a sudden he says, Dad, Dad, he finds this thing. And all of a sudden he hears echoing out of the library of his father as he's writing down these very important, important things concerning the Hebrew language. Stop, Indy. Well, he called him Junior, actually. Stop, Junior. And Junior stops as he wants to be obedient to his dad. And he said, quote the Hebrew alphabet. And then he starts, but he only gets a few words and he slips on out as if to say, Dad, really don't care about what I'm doing. We have to be careful as fathers that sometimes our spiritual life don't get so ingrained in us and we have a desire to be all that God wants us to be that we sometimes leave our children in the lurch. There's been many a PK. How many of you know what a PK is? Preacher's kid. There's been many of a preacher's kid that after they've got old enough to go on their own, they've really walked away from the things of God because they felt that mom and dad were so ingrained and so interested in their ministry that they something was lost in the transition of the relationship between father and son and daughter. Thank you for those few amens. I'm speaking to you from the heart of a pastor and a raising five children in ministry. And were we perfect in all them things? Absolutely not. Did we make our mistakes in those areas? Sure we did. And anybody who's been in ministry would have to realize it. But I'm thinking of Enoch now maybe being one that was so into the things of God that I would imagine maybe there was times that he even had to take a second thought and evaluate whether his children were recognized like they should. Someone said one time, as a father was coming home and his children would come home and he would isolate himself into the study and he would study and prepare for the next sermon and seek God for an awesome word. And he was finding out he was having some problems with his children. He was losing contact with them and he went for counsel with a dear pastor friend and, and the pastor friend said to him brother maybe you ought to stop seeking God so much in the library you know it can also be spiritual throwing baskets with your son throwing a baseball it's also spiritual to find out what it is that your son desires and enjoys and Spend time doing it with him so he don't have to go out to the street to find somebody else that he can do it with. Is anybody with me? In Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21 through 23, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. How many of you know Methuselah is known as one of the older men in the Bible? Lived a long time. I see people fanning ushers. Please get a little air going in here. Thank you. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. Did anybody hear me? Sons and daughters. Just th think about being one of Enoch's children. Think about being in a household where righteousness flowed all the time. I believe a lot of that will flow over to our children. I believe we do need to live in a righteous home. I believe righteousness is the key to victory in our home. I believe our children need to see and need to know that we are fathers and we are parents that know how to pray, know how to seek God, know how to grab all the horns of the altar and come to the presence of God in times of trouble. When things are, are at a disarray and we don't have the answer, we need not to try to act like we have all the answers, but we need to come in the presence of God and seek his face. 
sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And then he walked with God. I honor this kind of relationship with God. I honor a man, Enoch, that probably walked in as much relationship with God probably the only one beside Jesus Christ that walked in such a relationship that he walked with God and he was no more. Just think about being Enoch's children. Other than Jesus, he had the most righteous man. He was the most righteous man that we know. Amen? Is anybody with me so far? And to be raised in that kind of family, all I can say is, wow. To be raised in a family where righteousness was there and balance was there and the right anointing was there and God's presence was operating in the house. I say, bless God, amen? I praise God for an example like Enoch, don't you? I praise God that we have some examples in the word of God that shows us what true fatherhood's all about. If we need anything today, we need more fathers, we need more men that will take young men under their arm and under their wing. We have too many young men that didn't experience a good father. We have too many men in our society that didn't, that didn't experience uh, being raised by a mom and a dad that walk in the things of God and take them to church and show them the principles of God. Many of them came out of broken homes and divorced situations and situations where they didn't understand the father's love or a father not only not loved them but even abused them. And we wonder why many of our young men today are, are marred and scarred by different things that took place. So I have a real heart for young men that need to know that Jesus can be Lord of their life. And they can have men in the church to teach them the ways of God and teach them how to be good fathers, teach them what it means to be a husband, teach them what it means to be a godly man. Is anybody with me? Then there's Brother Noah, a father that, a father that God trusted with the future of the world. Think about it. God trusted Noah with the future of the world. It was 2,000 years from the time of creation to the time of the flood. Things have gone downhill. Genesis chapter 6, God said I, hey, there was so much sin and there was so much degradation and there was so much evil going on that God said I, I, I repented that I created man. But he found one man that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that was Noah. Noah, who was concerned about saving his children. Noah, who taught them about righteousness. Did you know that also Noah, it says that he walked with God. Now you have to open up your Bible to check me out, but it says that he walked with God. Now we think that Noah, that, that Enoch was the only one, but the scripture says that he walked with God in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Sham, Ham, and Japheth. Do you know that all the descendants after that, the whole world, we all have to look back to Sham, Ham, and Japheth as the descendants that we have all originated from? And from these three sons... The whole world exists. God saw so much, uh, so, so much anointing in this man Noah. God saw a man that would be obedient. He saw a man that would walk by faith and not by sight. He saw a man that was willing to build a large, massive ark. 350 miles from the closest body of water up on the side of a mountain. And for, tw and for the first 2,000 years of creation, it never rained. Water came up from the earth. Water it came down as a mist, but it never rained. Are you with me? But God spoke to Noah and says, I'm going to destroy this earth. I want you to build an ark to house the two kinds of every animal that I created and your children and your family 
and I'm going to, and you are going to get in the ark. And when I close the door, it'll be closed. And how many of you know Noah's ark is a, is a type and shadow of the ark of Jesus that we have today? How many of you know Jesus is the ark for us? How many of you know when we're in his safety, no matter what's going on around us, no matter what the world is doing, no matter what circumstances is happening, no matter what goes on in this, in this uh, nasty world that we live in, and we know that it's crumbling and falling apart by the minute, I want you to know if you're in Christ Jesus, if you're born again, if you ask him to come into your heart and into your life, you are in the ark of Jesus Christ, and he will see you through, and he will take care of your family, and he will have a place in in heaven for you. Somebody ought to praise him. I like what it says in Genesis 8 verse 1. It says, and then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark and God made a wind pass over the earth and the water subsided. Because God's a God of promise. God's a God that whatever he says, he'll do it. His promises are yea, that's yes, and amen, that's so be it. God said, I will protect you. I will take care of you. Get in the ark because everything is going to be destroyed. And you know the story. When the water subsided and the winds quit and the rain stopped, Noah sent out a dove. And when he sent out a dove and it didn't come back, he knew there was land somewhere. And we know he, he knew that when it, when the dove came back with a with a uh, a piece of uh, green leaf in his in his beak, he knew that there was something out there that was, the water subsided because God's a God of promise. And my brothers and sisters, listen: if we'll walk in the statutes of God, if we'll walk in His anointing, if we'll trust Him, He'll also be the ark of safety for us. What a witness to His children, as He was obedient to God. I'm sure his children, his children even wondered at one time, has dad gone mad? Has he lost his mind? He's sitting up here on the side of the mountain every day. He's chopping down trees and he's making logs and he's digging in the dirt for pitch and he's trying to make this great big massive. This just wasn't, this just wasn't a small boat, you know. This was a massive, massive vessel. And every day... Uh, Noah would be out working on it. I'm sure his sons wondered, I wonder if dad's lost it. But his faithfulness and his son saw one day that God was the God of faithfulness. And when God spoke, he had a, they had a father that was able to listen and the whole world was destroyed. But Noah and his family. Church, I'm, remember, I'm reminded for a few moments of Abraham who was given the title the father of all nations or the father of those that believe. As we mention the word of God, he recognized the anointing. He recognized the power of God. He recognized when God spoke it was for real. In Genesis 18, in, in, in Genesis 18 it says, Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. Listen, I believe God wants to understand that we are responsible for our children. Fathers, we are responsible for our children to bring them up in the ways of the Lord and as they grow older, they won't depart from it. We are responsible to instruct them in godly things. We are responsible to set a godly example. That's the reason why it's not proper to send our children and send our wives to church because after all, Sunday school must be for women and children. But it's a place where men ought to gird themselves up and say, I will set the example and I'll show them that godliness is it is powerful that walking in the things of God will bring the right result. What a great, great responsibility as fathers to walk right and to do right and to live right. I say praise the Lord. It's an awesome responsibility to be titled and given the honor as father. As to be given the responsibility as father. 
What a great responsibility. I appreciate what Henny said. Was that a great day when he held that little bundle in his arms, which was his son was born? 1962, I lost my son. In 1962, I buried my son. He was still born. He was born with hydroencephalitis, and back in those days, they couldn't fix it. But then four years later, I was working as a mechanic in a service station. My daughter was born. Beverly was born. It's one of the most important days of my life. I'll never forget it. it was as, it's as fresh today, Brother Henny, as it is when you remembered I will be born. That was my girl. That was the love of my life. In my service station, I posted signs all around the windows. I wanted everybody to know that it was a girl. I want everybody to know she is my girl. And I want everybody to know how much I loved her and what a great responsibility was laid upon my shoulders to be a father that made the difference in her life. I think every dad, every father ought to take that responsibility so serious and recognize it's the greatest job that we have. The scripture says, what profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? But let me say this, what profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own family? What if, we're, what if we're out ministering to the world? What if we're doing evangelistic work around the world? What if we're, what if we're ministering and counseling and helping other people while our own family's falling apart? God help us. My first responsibility is to my family, is to my children, is to my wife, to be the man of God that she needs, should be the security she needs and the protector that she needs. And somebody know that I'm always going to be there and she don't have to be fearful that one day I'm not going to show up. And to be that kind of father to my children. It wasn't really easy back in those days. I raised that little girl for three years by myself from the time she was three years old to six. I worked a midnight job so I could be up for her in the daytime and get her to school and get her ready and take care of her. Those are things that weren't easy, but that's what fathers do when they have to do it. That's what mothers have to do when they have to do it. When we put our, when we put our heart into that, into that calling and realize that the children that God puts in our life, those children are not yours. Those children are not mine. Those children belong to God. They're gifts from the Lord. And if they're gifts from the Lord, then they're on loan to me for a season to do the very best I can to nurture and, and direct them and guide them into a place where they can finally one day fly out of the nest. They can leave the quiver as I reach back into that quiver and I pull that arrow out and I stick it into the bow of the Holy Ghost and pull back with that power and let that arrow go out that I've spent 18 or 20 years making it straight and making it balanced and keeping the end sharp so when it goes out, it'll hit the mark and make a difference in life. Is anybody following me this morning? Then how could we not forget Joshua? Then there's Joshua, who was given the commission to bring the children of Israel into the promised land. There's Joshua sitting under the anointing and the mentorship of Moses. There was Joshua that saw Moses go through many, many times of making the right decisions and handling things properly and being in the presence of God and hearing the voice of God and receiving the commandments of God. Joshua learned from the mentor that he had. I think we all need somebody mentoring us. I think we all need somebody that we can look up to and say, that's my mentor. That's the person that I'm going to follow as they follow Christ. I was with my mentor just two weeks ago, my pastor, Virgil Stone. Pastor's at a little church up in Flat Rock, Alabama. We celebrated 35 years of pastorate, and 
50 some years of the church being there because his mom started that church. What a man of God. I'll call him before this day's over and say, Happy Father's Day, Pastor. Because he's my mentor. He's one that I look up to because I've followed him as he follows Christ. <clears throat> Joshua, he learned so much from Moses. Until one day in Joshua chapter 1, God speaks to Joshua and he says, Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. You're not going to follow his leadership anymore. He's not the one that's going to bring these children of Israel into Canaan land. He says, but you're the one, so you be courageous. You be strong. Be of good courage. Don't buckle under the pressure. When hard times come, you remember how Moses handled it. When all these people start complaining and griping and and, 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 and don't like what you're doing. You remember how Moses called out to me. And, and I intervened in his behalf. You remember Joshua. Because Joshua trusted God when others would not. He didn't care what the other fathers were doing. And he and his family were going to serve God no matter what because he made that declaration. Are you with me? Because in Joshua 24 and verse 14 through 15, now therefore he said, fear the Lord. Serve him with sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river. And in Egypt, serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose for yourself this day. I love that, don't you? I love this declaration. I love this commitment. I, 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 I love this attitude of positiveness and resolute. He said, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose for yourself this day who you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served. You know, I believe, I, I believe this is appropriate for today, church. I believe we're living in a day where people are serving other gods. I believe we're living in a time where idolatry is as strong as it was back in Joshua's day. I believe we're living in a time where other things are, are crowding out and taking away the luster and the joy and the presence and the power of God in our life. I believe we're living in a time where the, where the nation is sin sick. And, and, and there needs to be a revival and there needs to be a presence of God. Uh, there needs to be the glory of God to fill the place. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Oh, but listen to this last part. Are you ready? Here it is. This ought, to, this ought to develop a shout somewhere in this house. If you want to serve the gods on the other side of the river, then go ahead. If you still want to be caught up in your idolatry, go ahead. If you want to do other things and be interested in the things of God, then go ahead. But as for me and my house, oh, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I believe we need to hear that from strong men today. We need strong men to make strong stands. We need men to say, as for me and my house. We need fathers to say, my children will not get lost in the shuffle. The devil will not come in and, and destroy my children with drugs and alcohol. The, the, the devil will not come in and rob my kids from the victory that's in my home by looking at other things and allow them to be destroyed. As for me and my, my house, we will serve the Lord. Yeah. And in Proverbs 17, 6, it says the grandchildren are the crowns of the old men and the glory of the children is their fathers. Did you see that? The glory of the children are their fathers. Then I love what it says in Psalms 127 and verse 3. Behold, the children are the heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the room is their reward. Psalms 127 verses 1 through 5 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, 
they labor in vain who builds it. In other words, if God's not involved, we're wasting our time. If he isn't head of our household, we're wasting our time. If we're going to live by the, uh, by the principles of the, uh, of the television station, and we're going to live by the principles of the programming, and we're going to live by the principles of the ungodly attitudes that's sweeping our land, uh, then, uh, then we're not going to make it. But if God builds a house, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows for so he gives his beloved sleep. They're like arrows in the hands of the warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has a quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed but shall speak with their enemies at the gate. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There were also those fathers in the Old Testament didn't do, that didn't fare so well. Do you know that? I'm going to remind you of just a few. There was David. I love David. He's a man after God's heart. He's a man that we can all identify with. But let me tell you about David. David could have done better. Everybody knows that David had, a, had an affair with Bathsheba. But I want you to know because of David's lack of confessing his sin before the Lord, he had incest in his own home. There was rebellion with his own son Absalom to try to destroy his ministry. Is anybody with me? His own son died uh, that, was, uh, that was given to him uh, by Bathsheba because of the sin in his life. I love David, but I want you to know David could have done better. It isn't how we run the race, church. It's how we finish it. It isn't how we start the race that uh, that brings us to victory. It's how we get to the end of the race. It's how we cross the finish line. I shared Thursday night on that scripture in in Hebrews chapter 12 that we're compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. Let's run the race with patience. Let's run the race with endurance because Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith and he's run the race before us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then I'm reminded of Saul. Saul could have done better. But Saul allowed jealousy and bitterness to build up in him. And he got angry because David came back from war. And, they, and, they, and the people were singing that Saul killed his thousand. But David killed his ten thousand. And bitterness built up. Don't ever let bitterness get in your heart. It'll destroy things in your life. It'll destroy relationships and destroy your family. It'll break the heart of your children. Then I'm reminded of Eli. Eli was one that actually raised Samuel in the temple. He was the priest. But the Bible says his own sons were in so rebellion that they stood in front of the temple and and they desecrated the temple and they had no respect for God and they had no, no concern about godly things and their own dad, but Eli was the priest. Listen, he could have done better raising those kids. Maybe he spent too, more, too, too much time in the presence of God and not enough time instructing his kids in the ways of righteousness. But I'm reminded of a couple of areas in the New Testament that speaks into my heart of good fathers. I'm reminded of Zechariah, the priest, when he went in and started to seek God and pray, and his wife Elizabeth was barren. And God answered his prayer and gave him a son. And his son was John the Baptist. And he spent 30 years on the backside of the desert preparing for his ministry. Zechariah had to do something right. Zechariah and Elizabeth instructed John in such a way uh, that his life was honored unto God. And what about Joseph, the father of Jesus? Joseph that brought his children up in the ways of the Lord and touched their palates with the things of God and instructed them into what was right. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30 says, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand for me and stand in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. 
What an indictment. What an indictment, church. That God would look for a man and find none. God would look for a man to stand in the gap and find none. That God would look for a man. But I'm going to be honest with you. I'm proud of Faith Outreach Center. And as your pastor, I think it's all right for me to have a little bit of pride over you. And I think it's okay for me to sometimes stand back and say, Lord, these sheep that you've given us into this sheepfold in the last 31 years, as I look at many of those that are part of this body that have gone out and are ministering around the world and touching lives and raising children in the ways of righteousness and you that come here on a, come to church and commit yourself to the things of God faithfully year after year after year. I can say, Lord, maybe in Ezekiel's day you didn't find none. But at Faith Outreach Center, you have some faithful men. You've got men that made decisions to walk with, with you. You've got men that are willing to stand in a gap for the family. Write these things down in the next few moments in closing. I want to share with you what God's looking for when he looks for a man. Number one, he looks for a man that's not afraid to make a decision. Men that aren't afraid to stand on their convictions. Men that aren't afraid to stand alone if necessary. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God's looking for men who will make the decision to serve God. Put away that which seems to be important and seems to be right if it stands in the way of things of God. Most important decision is the decision to serve Jesus Christ. Most important decision is put your hand in an nail scarred hand of Jesus. Make him Lord of your life. Until I made Jesus Lord of my life, my life was messed up. I wasn't right. I wasn't connected. Somebody told me one day, said, George, you're going to self-destruct if you don't turn your life over to Jesus. You're going down the tube. You're in the wrong, going the wrong direction. You're going to the, uh, to the uh, direction of, uh, of destruction. You're self-destroying yourself. And I put my hand in a nail-scarred hand. Somebody told me Jesus loved me. Somebody said, Jesus cared about me. And I made a decision to make Jesus Lord of my life. That was the greatest decision I ever made in my life. And then I made a decision to serve him. Then I made a decision that my wife and my children were going to serve the Lord. Then I made a decision that we was going to get in the presence of God and we was going to do what God wants us to do. Then when God called me to preach in 1973, I made a decision that I was going to follow him and I was going to surrender to him. And you see the results today. Number two, God's looking for men that has desire. Desire. God's looking for men and fathers that desire to know God personally. Apostle Paul said, I would that I could know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering." We need to have a desire to know God more every day. We need to have a desire to know the word of God and have the word of God hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. We need to have a desire uh, to walk in his footsteps and be diligent and be faithful and walk circumspectly in his presence and walk in such a manner that no matter what happens, what trial comes your way, no matter how hard it is, no matter what pain you have to go through, that you're persuaded that he is able to see you through. You're persuaded that he's bigger than that problem. He's bigger than that circumstance. He's bigger than that pain. He's bigger than that heartache that you're going through. Yes, God is able. When the winds blow and when the storms come and when the circumstances come, God's looking for men, fathers, dads, that will hold their family in their arms and say, listen, don't worry, sweetheart. Don't worry, children. This house isn't built on sand. This house is built upon the solid rock. And when the winds come and the storms blow and the, and, and the rains descend, the house will stand because you have a desire to serve God. The third thing, God's looking for men with dedication. 
Are you dedicated to walking him? Are you dedicated to make him Lord? Men like Daniel and the three Hebrew children, as they stood, and King Nebuchadnezzar said to three Hebrew children, bow at my, at my idols. They said, oh, king, we're not going to bow. We're dedicated to the Jehovah God. We're dedicated to the God that we serve. We're Hebrew boys. We don't bend and bow to the circumstances of the world. We don't bow to the idols of the world. We're not going to bow, O king, because our God's going to deliver us. But if he don't, you see, that's what dedication is. That's being resolute. That's having conviction. But if he don't, we're still not going to bow. We need to be dedicated. And then the last one in closing. God's looking for men that would have determination. Be determined. The Apostle Paul had determination. God's looking for men that will serve him no matter what the cost is. Are we serving God with, at any cost? Is he more important than the issues of life? Is he more important than the pressures of life? Do we have determination? I'm determined to be what you want me to be, oh God. I'm determined to go where you want me to go. I'm determined that my life is going to stand and I'm going to be the father. And the husband and the man, I'm resolute that God's going to be number one in my life. There's a lot of pressures on us men today. We're being pulled from every side. We're being pulled from every angle to fold and to give in. We deal with financial pressures. We deal with healing pressures. We deal with, uh, we deal, deal with pressures to make sure that we're measuring up as men of God. Am I being the provider I need to be? Am I being the father and the man that I need to be? I know there's a lot of pressures. But all oh, let me say, I serve a God that will strengthen you and give you what you need. We serve a God that will see you through if you walk in the anointing of God. Anybody hear me this morning? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. I like the men of this house to echo this with me. But as for me and my house, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Just for a moment. First of all, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus as your own personal Savior. You can't be that man that you need to be. You can't be that woman that you need to be. Because the only way we can do it is through Jesus Christ. You know why? Because we're not strong enough. There's an enemy out there. There's a battle going on. So if you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, would you allow this pastor to invite you to have a personal relationship with him? Could I challenge you as men and women of God this morning to allow Jesus Christ to take over your life? What a greater... There'll be a lot of Father's gifts. There's going to be meals served today. There'll be cards given saying how much different people love their father. Let me tell you, the greatest gift a father can give back to the family is one that's saved, born again, walking in the power of God, living under the anointing of Jesus Christ. That's the greatest gift a father can give his family. What a greater day. Let that happen. Maybe you're here this morning and you used to serve the Lord. You used to feel his presence in your life. You used to be strong in your life. The cares of the world and circumstances and situations have taken that luster away, taken that shine off your relationship with him. Maybe you would say, like David did when he cried out in Psalms 51, Oh God, create in me a clean heart. Restore within me the joy of my salvation. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
If you're here this morning and you need to make a decision or you need to recommit your life to let Jesus be Lord of your life, would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Is there somebody that would say me? God bless you, dear. Is there a hand back there? I see that hand. God bless you, sweetie. Somebody else by the uplifted hand say me too, Pastor. I want to get it right today. I'm not going to leave this place without knowing that I'm where I should be with God because we don't know what tomorrow holds. One more time, that's you. Raise your hand just so I can see your hand. You want to make a decision to make Jesus Lord of your life? I see that hand. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? Quickly, quickly, raise your hand. I want to pray for you this morning. Would you stand with me, please? Would the elders come to the altar for ministry? At the same time, those that just raise your hand, will you walk down this aisle? Step out of the aisle. Step out of the aisle. Meet me right here so I can take you by the hand. This is going to be a, change, a changing, changing life experience for you right now. You raise your hand. Will you come? Listen, I know there's a lot of family gatherings going on. Family waiting on fathers to take them out to dinner and gather at their house. But let this be the important moment right now. I'm only taking a few minutes. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray for every father that's in this house. That you've allowed the word of God to work on you just a little bit. And you've allowed the Lord, you've allowed God's word to stir you a little bit. You want to draw closer to Him. And you want the Lord God to, inter to intervene in your life. That there are some areas of being a father that you allow Him to improve. And I want every father that's willing to allow God to do a, do a new work come down here. And not just fathers, but every man that's in the house. Would you meet me right down here so I can pray for you? I feel like I need to pray for the men in this church. I want to pray for the men in this church. So I want you to come. Because I honor you. And I thank God for you. Maybe you're not a father. Maybe you haven't reached that point in your life yet. I don't care. I want the men in this church to gather at this old-fashioned altar. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Not only do I want to pray for the anointing of God to bring you to another level, but I'm going to pray that God will cause you to prosper cause you to walk in divine health cause the glory to flow through your life men are coming now I'm convinced Mickey can come over here a minute I'm convinced behind every good man there's a woman somewhere that's strengthened him and encouraged him we don't make it on our own, men. We're as weak as we can be. We just don't like to admit it. We need somebody to strengthen us and encourage us, but we don't, want to, we don't like to admit that. We want to think we're macho, we're tough. A real man admits when he needs help. A real man admits he needs encouragement. A real man won't stand alone. So I want every woman that has a man down here to come stand with your man.
because the strength of your life is that woman next to you. And she's a godly woman. She's the strength of your life. She cares about you. She's going to encourage you. She really loves you. Whenever you're feeling down and you don't and you need somebody to lift you up, she'll be the one to do it. As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Amen. I want to pray every every, every man, every marriage. Father, I pray right now over every relationship that's here. These mighty men of Faith Outreach Center. These men that stand in a gap and work hard every day to provide for their family. And struggle sometimes, God, to do the right thing. Lord, many times it's tough. Many times we come home exhausted and tired. and We need encouragement. God, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, that we'll get the encouragement from our wives and from the women in our life. And God, most of all, David encouraged himself in the Lord that we'll always get encouragement from you because you're a God that's bigger than any problem and bigger than any situation, bigger than any mountain. Bless these men and women that stand in front of me today. And on this Father's Day, let this be a day that we've been lifted up and encouraged. Let this be a day that we feel your strength. Let this be a day that we take serious as for me and my house. We're going to serve you. I pray for the anointing to flow on these that stand here. I pray, Lord God, for your blessings to overshadow them. I ask I'll be blessed coming in and blessed going out. Blessed in the city and blessed in the country and all that they put their hands to shall be blessed. Most of all, we'll realize your strength and your anointing and your love. And without you, we're nothing. And with you, we're the more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And God, if you be for us, then who can be against us? praise in Jesus name everybody said amen now turn around and give that person next to you a great big hug let somebody know you love them